was shocking. <laughs> Good morning. How's everyone doing today? Good. I didn't give you a chance. Good morning. There it is. All right. Welcome. Welcome uh, to everyone that's on uh, watching us on live stream this morning. Glad to see everyone there. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I was really ready for church this weekend, all right? After a, a long week of all the bombardment and different things, so it's good to come together as a church family and remember our promised future together, is it not? So more on that from a special message from Pastor Dave today, so so thankful. Okay, a couple uh, announcements here. Next week um, is the last week to bring your boxes for Operation Christmas Child, because we'll do the party or the, the loading party next week, is that right? Yeah. All right. Well, anyways, you got to have them here next Sunday. So make sure you do that. If you don't have a box yet, there are some in the back. Um, I think there's still some things you can uh, grab on that table to pack in your box if you would like that uh, some people have sewn up and give some love to. You. So um, feel free to grab some of that stuff on the table to use as well. Um, Digging Deeper is back this week on Monday evening. Uh, make sure you're back for that. Um, also, will be live stream as well if you can't make it. Um, and youth group tonight. Here at 6. Looking forward to having the youth group back together again. Okay, so I'm going to have you guys stand with me as we do this month's memory verse. And I just think it's uh, always so timely to know that our, our truth, the truth that we know, not man's wisdom, but God's wisdom is here in the Bible, and we, we have it right here in our memory verse this month. Repeat after me. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Fantastic. You did so well. We're going to do it one more time. Here we go. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So today we're going to have a, a couple things on mission moment here this morning. Why don't you go ahead and have a seat. Uh, and we're going to run a video for Operation Christmas Child this morning. Followed by that, uh, Larry Lawhead will be coming up and giving us an update on the Gideon's work. So we look forward to that. Every shoebox gift starts its journey with individual love. And each item packed an expression of that love. From there, it finds its way to a drop-off location with thousands of these centers located all over the world. Trucks then transfer the shoebox gift to processing centers where they will be inspected and prayed for by volunteers. Then they're loaded onto containers heading overseas covering thousands of miles. At port, the shoebox gifts resume the journey on ground. Some by road and some by trail, concluding their journey at a local church. Each shoebox gift is given to a child in need. Love has traveled many miles to bless that one child. Each shoebox gift is an opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus with a child. The child is then invited to attend a follow-up discipleship program where they will grow in their faith. After graduating from the Greatest Journey Discipleship Program, children will be equipped to share the truth and love of the gospel to family and friends, multiplying the body of Christ all over the world. Sally, I told you to get rid of that thing. Sally, you disobeyed me. What was that thing that Sally's dad was so upset about? It was a testament that was given to her the day before in school. 
by a Gideon. Who are the Gideons? The Gideons are groups of, a group of business and professional men, and we have one purpose and one purpose only. It's to share the knowledge of Jesus Christ to every man, woman, boy, and girl in the world. The Gideons were started in 1899 by three men. Today, we're in over 200 countries and, per, and uh, do the Bible in 93 different languages. As of last year, the Gideons have passed out over 2 billion copies of God's word. We place the Bibles in many avenues of life. We give them to middle school, high school kids, college, trade schools, hospitals, uh, doctor's offices, lawyer's offices, many things like that, members of our police and military. Each get a copy, if they want one, of God's word. After another drinking spree, I found myself shut out of my own home by my wife. That night I went to a motel where I found that some faithful Gideon had placed a Bible. As I read, God used James 4, 14 through 17, to get my attention. The next day I took the Bible with me and rented another motel room for seven days, during which time I delivered, or I devoured what God had to say. And in his word, and in a letter to my wife, I begged for forgiveness, which she granted and invited me back into our home. A new lifestyle began for us, and that has continued, thanks to that Bible put in the motel room. That's probably what we're most noted for, is the Bibles that are put in the, mo in the motel rooms. This one is, was placed in 1942. Um, I don't know how I got it, but I did, probably from Becky's dad. There, so how can you help? the Gideon ministry. First and foremost, pray. We need prayer. We need prayer for countries to open their doors to our countries. We need prayer for businesses and schools and open hands and open hearts. In Weld County, I'm a member of the North Weld Camp, which is the southern part of Greeley and Weld County. We have two schools that will let us place Bibles in the school, not in the schools, but give to the students. Fort Lupton and Kersey, and that's it. To do Greeley West, we stand in the parking lot of the King Supers parking lot on 35th as the kids go to lunch. Um, in the Northwell camp here, I think they're a lot more open. I know Eaton, they do usually the last week of school. And your small schools like Briggsdale, Prairie, they'll let them in. But it's hard. It, it's it's we had uh, we had one school uh, superintendent called the police on us when we went to hand out Bibles and we were on the public sidewalk. So we need prayer. We need prayer. Other ways that you can help is in the back behind the Christmas uh, presentation. There is a card rack, and the Gideons, no charge to you guys, have cards you can praying for you in memory um we even have these weird ones that say uh, pastor appreciation um but you can for five dollars you can donate a bible in somebody's memory graduation present a lot of things like that uh that are are done charlene had to, oh with, i wanted to say with the part with the military the very first military distribution that was done was in August of 1941. And it was at this base called Pearl Harbor. And we all know what happened a few months later. Charlene Hitata's mother was living in Hiroshima when the atomic bomb was dropped. She and two of her brothers survived, but endured long recoveries from radiation poisoning. After the war, they decided to move to Hawaii to be near her father's family. Sometime during this period, an American serviceman gave Charlene's mother a New Testament that he had received from the Gideons. 
Both of Charlene's parents were Buddhists, but Charlene's mother kept it among her possessions. Many years later, as Charlene's mother was laid dying, she gave her daughter the New Testament because Charlene had become a Christian. Charlene then used that testament to lead her mother to the Lord before she passed away. Some years later, her father was stricken with Alzheimer's disease and told Charlene that she wanted to be with his wife when he died. She prayed that her father would have the clarity of mind when she talked to him about Jesus and that he would be receptive to the gospel. After presenting the gospel again to her father using the same New Testament, Charlene asked him, if now he wanted to accept Jesus, and he said yes. One of the original Gideon service testaments given in 1941 to an American serviceman during World War II was passed on to a Japanese woman, and it led her, her husband, and to her and her husband's salvation many years later. God's word truly does not return void. Other ways, other ways you can help is back on the information table. We have bulletins that have an envelope. If you would like to give to the Gideons, there's an envelope in there that you can mail in. And what you need to know, and one of the things that we really do stress, is that every penny, every penny given to the Gideons is used for the purchase and distribution of Scripture. No administrative costs, none of that. It's all paid by our, the, us, the Gideons, ourselves. Not a lot of ministries anymore, you can say that. There is no overhead costs that are paid by people that donate money. Every penny goes. The other thing you can do is we need help. We have 30 Gideons in the camp here in North Weld. We have about uh, 18, I think, in the Northwell camp, that I, or the Centennial camp that I belong to. Uh, excluding this year because of COVID, um, the Northwell camp normally hands out about 4,500 testaments a year. And the Centennial camp that I belong to, since we are blocked out of all the schools in the area, we do the town celebrations much like the Eaton Community Days. We do Kersey Days, Platteville Days, Fort Lupton Days, and we do about 6,000 a year, along with UNC, Northwell Camp here does Ames. So about 10,000 testaments a year are handed out by about 45 men and ladies. The auxiliary is a very, very vital part of our ministry. Their first thing they do is they lift up the Gideons in prayer, and they have their distribution points in the uh, nurses, the nurses in, in nursing homes and that uh, such. And they are actually, the auxiliary is known as the largest women's Christian organization in the world now. And so they are very, very much appreciated and very much a vital part of what we do. So those are some things that you can do to help. Um, thank you for letting me speak today. Um, I know it's been a while since we've had a report here, but um, uh, that's okay. Back to Sally. Sally Johnson was from Durban, South Africa. She had gone to school, and the Gideon had given her a testament much like this one. She didn't really know what it was. But when she got home, she started reading it. And she couldn't put it down. Her father came in and saw she was reading that Bible and said, Sally, get rid of that thing. I don't want one in the house. Get rid of it. But she couldn't. The next day, or the next morning, she came, well, during the night, she had turned her life over to Christ. And the next morning, she came out and came out to give her daddy a kiss goodbye. And she dropped her bag. And amongst the things that fell out of that bag was his testament out on the floor. Sally's dad was obviously upset. 
Sally, I told you to get rid of that thing. You disobeyed me. And she said, I'm sorry, Father, I will. She walked over, gave her dad a kiss goodbye. And she went to school. He went off to work. And unbeknownst to him, he stuck that testament in his coat pocket. Later on that afternoon in Durban, South Africa, the sirens went off because there was a cave-in in the mine, the mine where Sally's, Sally's daddy worked. Three days later, when they brought the bodies of those miners up, clutched in Sally's dad's hand was that testament. Written in the loose leaf in the front, it said this, Sally, thank you. I love you. I will see you in heaven. Thank you. Powerful stories, right? You know, God's ways are not our ways, right? We never know one little thing that we might do, one little share of the gospel, one handing out of a Bible, one sending a box across the country full of toys where the gospel message is presented, how that all affects someone's eternal life. So love hearing those. Great to thank you for sharing today, Larry, and the great work the Gideons are doing. If you guys will stand with me this morning as we read from God's word, we'll be reading from Psalm 2, 1 through 6 this morning, the reign of the Lord's anointed. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. This is the reading of God's holy word. Let us pray for the service here this morning. Dear gracious and heavenly Father, we're thankful to be together this morning to commune with one another. Father, we are living in a day unlike anything we have seen before. Chaos, confusion, and turmoil has been stirring up in so many hearts here, even this week, Father. But Father, we trust that justice belongs in your hand. We also trust that you have a great plan. And Father, we trust that we will see hearts transformed and lives changed. So we thank you for your son, for his grace and mercy. We thank you for our salvation through him, for his work on the cross on our behalf. Father, we look forward to your great redemptive plan in this earth. So Father, help us fix our eyes on Christ, even when we're tempted by the problems here around us. We're asking that you would give us the boldness to proclaim the only solution that our world, to the problems our world is experiencing today, and that is to trust in your glorious gospel. So Father, today we pray for Pastor Dave's message to us. We pray for the, the rest of this worship that we will offer you today. And we ask this through your son's holy and gracious name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing praises to the Lord this morning. Okay, the first thing I need to do is dismiss the children, and so uh, we'll ask them, first grade and under, to uh, join Carla at the back. And then I just want to add my word to whatever has been said today about the Operation Christmas Child and the Gideons. There's no better place to put uh, effort and money can help bring others to come to Christ. And so uh, please support these as the Lord leads you to do that. We do support, by the way, the Gideons um, through our mission committee, but we certainly in, um, encourage you 
to consider uh, that they be one of the organizations that you support in your mission giving personally as well. well I'm reading this morning from uh, Daniel chapter 2. We're taking a little respite from 1 Timothy as the week went along. I thought, you know, we um, maybe need to speak to some of the issues that are going on. And um, so Daniel chapter 2, the background here is that Daniel has been presented in Babylon by the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar with a dream which no one can interpret it because the, because the king has said, not only do I want you to interpret the dream, why don't you tell me what it is? That was a pretty smart move. If you think about it, if you could tell him what it is, you'd probably get the interpretation right. No one could do it. So under threat of death, including wise men like Daniel, who had not really been given an opportunity up until this point, uh, the, under threat of death, Daniel and his friends prayed. God gave the revelation. And then Daniel says this in Daniel 2, verse 20. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever in whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. This is God's word to us this morning. Let's pray together. Our Father, as we search in your word for the hope and the strength that you would want to impart. We pray that your Holy Spirit will be our teacher. We pray that you will guide us through um, the hard things that are going on in our society all the way from the COVID virus as it continues to spike significantly in our area. The election results, all of these things, Father, we need to commit to you the fires that are going on that are so destructive. Thank you that behind all of it, there you are, but we need to see you this morning and to understand exactly what this means to us. And so we pray for your guidance and your help and your wisdom in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The question I have posed in the title of this sermon this morning is, who won the election this week? Who won the election in 2020? Right at the moment, it appears that we will have a new president, assuming that he is confirmed, that raises grave concerns, any of you who have been watching what's going on, regarding the future of religious freedom in our country and acceptance of biblical values in our culture. I'm led to speak to this, not as a Democrat or as a Republican, my view uh, politics and religion don't mix very well. We need to be sure we know which track we're on, whatever our calling might be. But there are clear moral and biblical issues at stake here, and that gives us as a church certainly the right and, in fact, the privilege and even the responsibility to speak to some of these things. If Mr. Biden is confirmed as president, there will be serious challenges to those of us who hold that the Bible is our authority for faith and practice. Mr. Biden has indicated his intention to see the Equality Act passed during the first 100 days of his administration. Now, the Equality Act, if you don't know what it is, sounds like a really good thing. In fact, it provides the basis for discriminating or for for preventing people like private religious organizations from discriminating on the basis of sexual issues as well as others that represent a key factor in their faith. This act was approved by Congress about a year ago. It was rejected by the Senate at that time. But should it pass and should some of the other initiatives that Mr. Biden is committed to gain traction, here are a few of the things that we can expect. We can expect an all-out effort to strengthen the current abortion laws and broaden their definition, as was on the ballot in Colorado and passed, as you probably are aware, to include babies up to full term and even beyond. We can expect that doctors will be forced to perform abortions against their conscience, and companies will be forced 
to pay for them against their convictions. We can expect that aggressive effort to further the LBGTQ agenda of forbidding discrimination regarding sexual orientation and or sexual identity, the so-called SOGI issues, even by religious organizations and private schools. We can expect that Christian schools and organizations could be forced to hire homosexual teachers and administrators, even though that's against their religious convictions. That almost passed. That came within a whisker of passing in California a year ago, only at the last moment where there are obviously a large number of Christian schools. Was it defeated? But it will be back up again, and now it's up on the national level. Even churches obviously could be affected by this with the threat of losing their tax-deductible status if they continue to discriminate in this way. And worse, hate crimes for speaking to God's truth on these issues may not be far in the future. They've already been instituted in other places around the world. Public funding of abortion and gender realignment surgeries will be pushed, even though they will be being paid for by people who object to those on the basis of their faith. We can expect parental rights to be reduced when it comes to these issues. All of this, particularly with regard to sexual identity, despite the fact that 80%, 80% of gender dysphoric children, in other words, children that are confused about their, about their gender identity, turn to their biological birth gender when they become adults. Now, this is the tip of a very large iceberg. I mean, this list could go on and on. But it's not my intention this morning to be a prophet of doom. Rather, I'd like to say, what can we do about some of these issues? How can we address these challenges? And the list that I originally came up with was very long. For your sake, I have cut it down. <laughs> two things we can do, two things that we need to Remember, two things to do. Number one, continue to pray. I know that some of us were praying for a different outcome to this election. And the tendency is when things don't come out the way we pray for them is to give up on the prayer and give up on praying. In fact, the opposite should be the case. This is the time to pray more than ever. In fact, how do we know that God hasn't allowed these results just for that purpose, to get us to pray more? Because God responds to prayer. In Daniel's time, we'll look at Daniel a few times through this because, well, I'll tell you why. In Daniel's time, which was about 600 B.C., the people of Israel were praying diligently that Babylon would not be allowed to come in and take them captive. It happened anyway. And Daniel, as one of the best and brightest among the Israeli young people, he was in his teenage years, somewhere between 15 and 19, was taken into captivity to Babylon to be trained for government service. From that moment for the rest of his life, Daniel operated in a government hostile to his faith. So this is nothing new, right? It's happened before. Daniel had been there. So what did he do? Did he quit praying? No way. We find Daniel praying in Daniel 2 and Daniel 4 and Daniel 6 and Daniel 9 and Daniel 10 and several times I'm sure in between that it's not specifically mentioned. When jealous co-workers decided they wanted to get rid of him, you recall in Daniel 6 how they got the, te the, the king to issue an edict that no one could pray to anyone except the king for a period of time on pain of being thrown into the lion's den. So what did Daniel do? Get up a petition, go see the king and say this isn't fair. You know what Daniel did? Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. You may want to look at it. It's very instructive. It says, when Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks 
to his God as he had done previously. In other words, the king's edict made absolutely no difference to Daniel. He continued to operate on the same basis that he always had. He continued to pray with thanksgiving. Even though things were certainly going against him at that point, he knew very well that he could be the one that was going to land, land up in the lion's den. He knew this had been aimed at him. Of course, we know the rest of the story, how God protected him in that particular case. But the point is he kept doing what he was doing. He kept right on praying. Beloved, we need to do the same. We must pray. We must pray, first of all, for revival. And God is very clear that revival starts with his people. We always want revival to start out there somewhere with other people. But God says in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, if my people, my people, who are called by my name, my people, if they will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. So it starts, revival starts with God's people. We must evaluate our own lives before we start picking on others. Sin that is there is enough to sink a ship. We know that. We need to be humbling ourselves before God, praying for his forgiveness in our own lives before we can turn to others. But then we can begin to turn to what we also want to pray about. Pray for the defeat of the measures that would violate the revealed will and the revealed character of God. That is entirely appropriate to do. And if they are passed anyway, what do we do? Keep right on praying. Pray for the will of God to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Pray for God's name to be hallowed because the time will come when God will answer those prayers. Here's the hard one. We must pray for our enemies. We must pray for our enemies. We must not hate. Jesus was very clear about this. Luke chapter 6, verses 27 and 28, he said, But I say to you, who hear, are we hearers, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. Beloved, that means that even as we hate the things that certain people are doing, even as we hate the agenda that we know they bring to the political arena, it is our privilege to pray that God will turn them around, that God will hem them in, that God will defeat their intentions, that God will turn them to the truth. We're good? We're good. Thank you, guys. We can't know what God's going to do unless we're asking, right? And so it is our privilege to pray. Let me tell you a little account. Unplanned. Some of you may have seen the movie Unplanned. Um, if you haven't, I would urge you to do so, though, with caution. Here's the podium. Is that good? Okay. Because of some of the... Um, things that you may see in that film, but the film is about a lady named Abby Johnson. Abby Johnson was the director of the Planned Parenthood chapter in Bryan, Texas for eight years. She hated the next door coalition for life people who used to come over and pray in front of her clinic. Well, one day, as she was transporting, because she regularly transported people to and from the young ladies to, the, to and from the hospital, although she didn't personally participate, but one day she was asked to help out with an abortion. And it was revealing to her. She saw a 13-week-old, normal-looking baby fight and squirm for its life against the tube that was being inserted to vacuum it out. She said this, she said, the baby looked as if it were being run out, wrung like a dishcloth, twirled and squeezed, and then it crumpled. And the last thing I saw was the tiny, perfectly formed backbone sucked into the tube 
and then it was gone. May I say that is about the mildest description of abortion that you can find. That's about as mild as it gets. Abby Johnson went back to work at her clinic. And over the next few weeks, she began to investigate. She learned that children in the womb have fingers and toes. They have organs. They have a separate heartbeat from the mother. They have a circulatory system. They have brain waves. They even have fingerprints. They have a different blood type from the mother. They feel pain. All of this before two months of gestation. It wasn't long before she was sitting in the office of a man named Sean Carney, who was the director of the Coalition for Life group that were next door to her, and she said, I can't do this anymore. Long story short, God turned her life around. She became an advocate for anti-abortion and has established an anti-abortion ministry despite the fact that she has been castigated by the Planned Parenthood movement, as you can imagine. You know, not saying that God will answer all of our prayers that positively. I'm not saying that. But we don't know if we don't ask, right? So we pray. Second thing we must do is continue to persevere. Keep the faith. Stand firm. Don't give in. Don't cave. In Babylon, when Daniel got there, they wanted him to eat food that violated his conscience. We didn't know exactly why it's not spelled out. Possibly it had been offered to idols and he objected to that. I think there's a possibility that it was in violation of what he knew to be the dietary laws of Israel because they had some very specific ones. But in any case, he didn't want to eat that food. But he, so he wouldn't cave, but neither was he belligerent. In fact, he came up with a plan and he said, why don't we do this and let's test this out and let's see if what God asks us to eat doesn't lead to greater health than what you want me to eat. And we know how that came out. But he stood. Imagine being a teenager and standing in the face of the opposition like this and saying, I'm not going to eat the king's food. But I have, an, I have another plan. Let's see if it doesn't work out better this way. And I heard Al Moeller, Albert Moeller, I hope, I hope you're all, we're finding, we're finding family members and church members listening to Al Moeller 30 minutes a day, sometime in the morning or whatever. We do it at breakfast. I hope you all do it. It's the news from a, from a Christian worldview, and you need to be listening to it if you want to know what's going on in the world. He's president of Southern Seminary, and he has a unique gift for presenting this. But I heard him years ago at a conference. It was prior to the same-sex marriage uh, being, being adopted as the law of the land in 2015. So I suppose it was a conference in 2012 or 13 or something. But already he was urging those attending the conference not to cave on the issues of the sexuality that, ha that were suddenly coming to the forefront. Homosexual rights and sexual identity rights. He noted that it was becoming hard that many church leaders and many Christian organizations, in order to be politically correct rather than biblically sound, had caved on these issues. But then he said this, and I never forgot it because it made such an impression upon me. He said, there is one good thing out of all of this, and that is this. We will soon know where everybody stands. We'll know who's real and who's not. We'll know who really believes the Bible and who doesn't. That was important. And of course, it's proven to be true, as we have seen since then a growing number, increasing number of compromising organizations and churches on these very issues. The trend, in fact, is epidemic. Epidemic. Beloved, we're not doing what God wants us to do if we don't love and appreciate the struggle and the battle that some people go through when it comes to these temptations. We have to do that. But neither can we justify what God calls sin very clearly in his word, what violates his character on the basis that we feel certain personal empathy for individuals. I have felt this, and I'm sure you have, with people that I have known 
who suffer from these temptations, but we cannot turn around and call right wrong and wrong right. Now, the question always arises, well, can't you be gay and be Christian? You know, we might as well ask, can't you be sexually licentious, heterosexually licentious, and be Christian? I can't look into people's hearts. I can't. But I can tell you what God says about this. And you need to look at it with me. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. God has some strong language reserved for those who want to live a lifestyle that violates his laws and his principles and most of all his character because his laws are always a reflection of who he is. 1 Corinthians 6 beginning in verse 9. Paul's writing but God is speaking. He says, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Then he's going to define unrighteous for us. What do you mean by that? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral. It's a word, porneia, that means any sex outside of marriage. Sexual encounters outside of marriage. Neither the sexually immoral. And, and by the way, Jesus clarified that to mean thought life issues as well. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, those who are unfaithful to marriage partners, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy. How did that get in the list? Right. Nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. That's pretty direct, isn't it? Pretty straight. God is telling us like it is, and it's heavy. But there is hope. There's always hope when there's God, and the hope here is in the very next verse. Look at it. He goes on and says, And such were some of you. Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. We all have a past, beloved. Somewhere in this list we all fit. Our righteousness would never get us past this list, but the righteousness of Jesus Christ can. And we put our faith and trust in him. We have redemption that we could have no other way. And so there is the hope. The hope is in the resurrection and power of Jesus Christ to apply to the issue that is particular to my life or to your life, that power to release us from the captivity to sin that we have been involved in. But Jesus says, you stick with that, you choose that over me, and you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. If that's your lifestyle, if that's who you are, you must come to faith in Jesus. So we have to stand as ambassadors of truth, right? Loving ambassadors of truth. Where were the disciples, you know, when they're preaching on the streets of Jerusalem and they got arrested and the authorities called them in and said, no more preaching. We don't want to hear any more about Jesus. You're trying to lay his blood at our feet. No more preaching. And what did they say? Acts 5, verse 29, you know, Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. In other words, they're saying it's, 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 they were just simple and direct and to the point. We're under new management, guys. So where your orders are in conflict with his orders, we have to obey him. And they did. And so must we. You know, perseverance in doing the right things, perseverance in following the word of God will take many different forms. God will call some of us to take an active role in the political process. There's some people in our own church who are involved in the politics, political process, and it's appropriate and right that they should do this and take their God-given values and biblically-oriented values into those arenas. 
But all of us must be ready, willing, and able to stand for the truth with our neighbors, with our friends, with our acquaintances, with others. We, we want everyone to know, you know, we're called intolerant. What, how intolerant would it be if I knew you had cancer and I don't tell you? The intolerance is if I hide the truth, right? And this is equally important. In fact, it's far more important because this is the issue of eternal life and death. The only intolerant thing to do would be to stay quiet. We want people to experience the freedom that the truth brings. And here is truth in the word of God. It's truth that is found in the one who created us and who knows more about us than anyone else ever will. Human wisdom may be going one direction. God's wisdom is going another direction. So which are we going to follow? I love what one woman did when... Young lady, Sade Patterson was her name. She was president of the Students for Life at the University of New Mexico. And on a particular year, not too long ago, they had what most universities now hold, which is called a sex week. If you're a parent and you're about to send your children off to a secular college, you should visit them on sex week. You should visit them anytime, find out what's going on. But you, you, I'm telling you, your eyes, eyebrows will be raised. Sex week. During sex week, basically they promote any kind and everything, every kind of experimentation with sex you can imagine. There are workshops to cover everything you want. I can't even mention the titles, let alone the content of the workshops in this environment. That's what goes on on college campuses. And it's all aimed, basically there's one message in all of this, and what it is is anything goes and there are no consequences. That's the message. That's what the kids are being told. So experiment. Find out what you are, who you are. Find out what you like. So what did Say do? Get up a group of people and go through the campus holding placards and, you know, down with sex and whatever else? No. She made her own workshop. It was called Real Sex. Probably got a lot of attention, I suspect, with a title like that, right? She invited some experts in to speak to the biological the psychological and the theological aspects of sexuality from a biblical perspective. Obviously, it spoke to the obvious consequences of sex used wrongly in all of these areas. And then it spoke to the wonder and the delight and the joy of sex when it's in the right context. And the fact that you can't get anywhere else what you can get in that context. Somebody who was willing to take a stand in a positive way. So we must pray and we must persevere. Then two things to remember. First thing we must remember, God controls. God controls. If you don't get anything else that I say this morning, I hope you get this. God rules. God always rules. When Daniel was deported to Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar was the most powerful man in the world, one of the greatest men who's ever lived in human history. And yet in Jeremiah chapter 27, verse 6, God refers to him as, oh, my servant, Nebuchadnezzar over here, my servant. When God wanted to get Israel out of captivity after 70 years because he had promised that he would bring them out of captivity after 70 years, he took the latest, most powerful man on earth, Cyrus the Persian, Cyrus the Great, known to history as Cyrus the Great, he had him issue an edict that said the Jews could go back to their homeland. Thus, he was ignorantly fulfilling what had been God's rule and God's prediction that would happen all along. God refers to Cyrus, whom he, by the way, called by name, predicted by name a hundred years before he was ever born. And he calls him in Isaiah 44, verse 28, my shepherd, and says he shall fulfill all my purpose. And then the next verse, Isaiah 45, verse 1, he calls him my anointed. These are the most powerful men on earth. When God needed to get Mary down to Bethlehem from Nazareth in order to, for Jesus to be birthed where it had been prophesied in Micah 5, 2 that he would be birthed in Bethlehem, and she's up in Nazareth 90 miles away, which is where she lives, God took the latest, most powerful man on earth whose name was Caesar Augustus, 
moved him to issue an edict that all the world must be taxed, not just part of it, not just Rome. This caused Mary and Joseph to have to go from Nazareth to Bethlehem in order to follow this edict so that Jesus could be born exactly where it had been said that he would be born. God rules, beloved. God always rules. Jesus was standing before Pilate, and he clammed up. They had a kind of an interesting conversation for a while. And then Jesus clammed up, and in John 19, verse 10 and 11, we're told, So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the authority to release you and the authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Pilate thought, sure, he got his authority from Caesar, Tiberius, and from his friend Sejanus. He just got it from God. Everybody gets their authority from God. It doesn't matter who they are. Pilate got it from God. Trump got it from God. Biden gets it from God if he gets to be president. It comes from God, beloved. It's not, it doesn't come from anywhere else. Romans 13, verse 1, what does he say? Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. Why? For there's no authority except from God. And those that, have, that exist have been instituted by God. This was written when Nero, one of the most profane man in history, was on the throne in Rome. You know, it's, it's not that hard to be the ultimate authority when you're forever and everybody else slips on and off the stage of history very, very quickly. God not only is in control, God not only rules, but even while people are in power because God put them there. Here's what it says in Proverbs 21, verse, verse 1. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. That's who God is. That's the God that we serve. That's the God that's in charge. So you say, well, if God is always in charge and if God rules, how come things don't always come out good? And the answer to that question is, it does. Just not from our perspective. We don't see things from God's perspective. We don't have the big picture yet. God does. And it all comes out good from his perspective. Why does it come out bad from our perspective? Because God has bigger purposes. God has greater purposes than to make everything come out exactly right for rebellious people of whom we are part. God has greater purposes than to make everything perfect in a fallen world. God has purposes to bring people back to himself. God has people to judge those purposes to judge those who will not. God has purposes to reveal who is and who is not. And he works them all out through the way that he takes the king's mind, the king's heart. Did you know that God sometimes, even in this life, God sometimes judges people by giving them exactly what they want? Did you know that? It's exactly what Paul says in Romans 1. He's talking about the depravity of his own day and time in the Roman Empire. And he says this concerning those people in, in, in Romans 1 verse 24. God gave them up. Some of the most chilling words in the Bible, are they not? God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity. You want impurity? Go for it. Wait and see what happens. Two verses later, Romans 1.26, God gave them up to dishonorable passions for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. It's interesting that, to me that he lists women first there. I'm not sure why, but in the very next verse, he makes clear the men have done the same thing. God gave them up. You want that? Go for it. Romans 1.28, God gave them up to a debased, debased mind to do that which ought not to be done. Listen, we'd be feeble-minded if we didn't think God might be judging America in the same way, giving us exactly what we as a culture want. 
Now, I, I don't pretend to know the mind of God, and I can't tell you exactly why God does what God does, but I can tell you these are some of the ways that God operates. We know this, God rules. We know this, his ways are always right. We know this, someday when we see the whole picture, can you imagine when we see the puzzle all put together, we see the last piece put in place, and we stand back and we look at what God did in history and we say, wow, God was right. God never made a mistake. God never slipped up. God never allowed something that wasn't eventually for his glory and for the good of all of those who loved him. Listen, beloved, that's the God we serve. He's producing his masterpiece through the way that he operates. And then secondly, under things to remember, God conquers. God conquers. In the end, God wins. Nebuchadnezzar fought God for a lot of years. God kept giving him little things as he went along. He gave him, he gave him uh, visions that, that predicted the future. He gave him Daniel to tell him what those visions meant. The king was sort of for a little while, he'd kind of get on board that this is God, but he also had his other gods over here, and he, he, he never would quite come along. And then toward the end of his life, Daniel chapter 4, God came to deal with him again. And he told him, this is what's going to happen if you don't get over your pride. And then he gave him a whole year, and nothing happened for a whole year. And, and so Nebuchadnezzar did what most of us do. Nothing happens, we think nothing's ever going to happen. He's standing on his balcony one night, and he, he looks out over, and he says, is this not great Babylon that I have built? And believe me, Babylon was, was impressive. We've seen some of the walls at the British Museum, and some of you may have seen them as you go around the world. It's an impressive city. Is this not great Babylon I have built? And God said, okay, that's it. That's enough. And he sent him out into the fields for seven years, living like an animal. When he came back, here's what Nebuchadnezzar wrote. He said, I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will among the host of the heavens and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? He got the picture. In the end, God won. In the end, God always wins. I actually think we may see Nebuchadnezzar in heaven someday. I don't know, but this is different from what he said in Daniel 2 when he encountered God. God always wins. Satan thought he had disposed of Joseph when he got his brothers to sell him into slavery in Egypt. Gone for good, that was what Satan thought. But you know the story how God raised Joseph from slavery to become the prime minister of Egypt so that he could provide the food that would save his own family, particularly his brother Judah, through whom the seed was coming, through whom the messianic line was coming. If Judah dies... There is no Messiah. There is no redemption. Everything that happened there is pertinent to you and me because if Joseph doesn't go down there and do what Joseph did, there is no Savior. God couldn't go back on his promises. But Joseph told his brothers later, he said, as for you, you meant evil against me. I know that. But God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Let me tell you, welcome to Satan's world. He never makes a move that God doesn't have a greater counter move. Never. Think about that. Never a move that God doesn't have a greater counter move. That's his life. You say, well, why does he keep, why does he keep doing it? I'll tell you why. Because somebody who is self-deceived deceives themselves. And that's what happens at the end of the day. And that's what's happened to Satan. You know, this is most clearly seen where? At the cross. Satan got Jesus nailed to the cross and he thought, that's it. It's all over now. Some of you remember there was a great, there was a great um, 
cantata a few years ago, very popular uh, by the, I think the Gaithers put it out. I don't remember the name of it, but at, at a certain point in this cantata, it represented Jesus being nailed to the cross. And as he's being nailed to the cross, Satan is saying, there, that's the end of that. And just as he's saying that, the music, the orchestral music rises to a crescendo and then it just stops. And for a few moments, there is absolutely dead silence. And then, and then, you hear these small little light chords just beginning slowly, softly, and then it begins to grow, and then it grows, and then it grows, and then it becomes a crescendo of, of, of musical orchestra, orchestra, orchestral music, representing, of course, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He didn't defeat him at all. He defeated himself. Welcome to Satan's world. That depiction represented a powerful truth. God just won the whole ballgame. So who won the 2020 election? I can tell you that. God did. God won the 2020 election. God always wins. God rules. God reigns. God is in charge. And while it may not have come out the way you wanted it or the way I wanted it, God made it come out exactly the way he wanted it. God won. Daniel 2, verse 21, God removes kings and sets up kings. And he didn't stop doing that because it's 2020. God is still in charge. He's made his selection at the moment. Whoever's going to be our president, if it's Biden, he's going to be our president for a moment. Jesus is going to be our king forever. And that's where our hope is, right? Jesus is our king forever. A few years ago, the National Religious Broadcasters held their large annual convention in Washington, D.C. President Reagan was asked to speak. Um, I think President Reagan had a certain faith in God and in Christ. Can't look into anybody's heart, but he certainly knew what to say and when to say it. And he made a great speech at that convention, and he ended it by quoting John 3.16. I mean, the applause was monstrous. Long after he left the platform, everybody was still applauding. Then Chuck Colson got up. Chuck Colson, a man who knows something about the seduction and the limitations of political power, right? He said he was glad for the speech, to have a president that would make a speech like that, and especially for the Bible quotation. But then he added this. He said, but we must remember that the kingdom of God is not going to arrive on Air Force One. That's an insight that we all need to remember, is it not? Politics are great, but that's not our hope. That's not where we put our faith. That's not where our trust is as those who are believers in Christ. I read of another man, football fan, watching his favorite teams one afternoon. His favorite teams were lousy. So it was a bad afternoon. His wife was in the kitchen. She heard him, you know, just railing on the teams one after another as bad play after bad play happened. And then all of a sudden, everything went quiet. And she thought, whoa, I wonder, I wonder if he had a heart attack. So she went in to check on him. Well, he was sitting there watching a World War II movie. She said, what are you doing? I thought you were watching football. And he said, well, I switched over to something where I knew our side would win. That's what I want to focus your mind on this morning. In the end, God wins, and so do those who love him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for, thank you for your word. We thank you for the assurance of who you are. Thank you that you're not any different today than you were 2,600 years ago, than you were 2,000 years ago when you walked the earth and the person of Christ. You're no different when you allowed the Reformation to come. You're no different. You haven't changed. You haven't lost one bit of power or interest. 
Not one bit of rulership has gone away. That's our hope. Our trust is in you, Lord. Not in any man, not in any group of men. Lord, we pray for the politics, all the things we mentioned that could be coming down the pike. We pray that you will prevent them. We pray that you will stop them cold. We thank you that it looks like maybe we'll still have a Congress, a Senate that might stop some of the foolishness from the perspective of your word. But whether that's true or not, our hope is in you. And so, Father, as we leave today, I pray it will be with, not with despair and not with wondering what's going to happen, but it will be in the, in the sh assurance that you're in charge, that you haven't missed a beat, and we can trust you with everything that's happening. Thank you for that in our Savior's name we pray. Amen. Will you stand? Mm -hmm.